Hi everyone, I'm Joe Brady, and we're here today to talk about getting prints that match the image we see on our monitors. That doesn't sound like a lot to ask for, does it? I mean, just send to the printer what I'm looking at and give me a beautiful print. If only it were that easy. Now, it can become much easier with a little bit of know-how and some tools to make it happen consistently. So why do we need these tools? Why doesn't it just happen, and what are the challenges? First of all, we're dealing with different color spaces. Our cameras capture the entire visible light spectrum. Our softwares work in up to ProPhoto RGB. Our monitor color space is well, either sRGB or Adobe RGB, and the colors we can print out on paper are gonna vary depending on what the surface is. So how are we gonna deal with this? Again, your camera captures more color than you can see. So what are we going to do with those colors? And that's where profiles are going to come into play. You need to understand what the limitations of the devices are. And what a profile does is it gives you the ability to translate color from one place to another so that it will best fit in the space that's available. Now before we go continue anymore, just take, let's discuss color spaces a little bit because this is something that really freaks people out. You've probably seen this chart before. This is a two-dimensional representation showing the relative sizes of sRGB, Adobe RGB, and ProPhoto RGB. However, keep in mind that these are actually three-dimensional spaces. And if we take a look at this, this is actually a 3D plot of the Adobe RGB space inside ProPhoto RGB. So yes, it's bigger. ProPhoto is the biggest space we have to deal with, so you should always use that, right? Maybe. I'll give you kind of a general recommendation for, for dealing with color spaces. And we'll get into this in more detail in some future sessions. In your software, in your original files, I recommend you stay in ProPhoto RGB. In Photoshop, that's done in color settings. In Lightroom, it's the default, which uses a, actually a variation of ProPhoto RGB. When you're gonna send a file out to someone else, that's when I recommend you change. Export it as an sRGB file. We'll discuss that more. In fact, in our next session, we're going to be dealing with sending out prints to a lab, and that's when you're going to want to do that. Now, since we're doing our own printing today, we're not going to be doing any color space changing. In the next session, we will, when we talk about preparing files for the lab. So I mentioned some tools and some know-how that is needed to make this all work smoothly. We're going to take a look at the tools first, and then we'll put some know-how to work in software. Today, I'm going to use the Color Monkey Photo from X-Rite. Now, this device has been around for several years now. It remains a steady and consistent performer on both Windows and Mac computers. I love this device because it really does a lot of what you need to have happen. So what we're going to do is take a look at the high points. I'm just going to do a quick run-through of how things work. We're going to do a monitor calibration. Uh, then we're going to create a custom printer profile that we can use in Photoshop and Lightroom. Then we'll actually go into software and put it to use. And as I mentioned, the reason I really like the Color Monkey Photo is because not only does it do monitor profiling, but it will also allow us to create those custom profiles for our papers. Now, calibrating and profiling your monitor is the single most important thing you can do for any color workflow. Let's take a look at some of the reasons why. So let's talk a little bit about how important your monitor is to, to the whole idea of color workflow and eventually getting prints that are going to look like what you saw on your monitor. If you really stop and think about it, your monitor is the one element that's going to have the biggest impact on what your prints are going to look like because it's your viewfinder for the world. It's your palette. It's where you're making your editing decisions. So if the image that's displayed on your monitor is slightly off because the monitor is slightly off, you're going to try to make edits that are going to correct for issues that are being caused by the monitor and are not actually part of the image file. Now something that happens very commonly is that monitors, particularly out of the boxes, are way too bright. And you'll, you'll look at an image on your monitor and, and it'll look a little overly bright, so you'll go ahead and you'll make some kind of adjustment. Say you'll go into Photoshop and bring the levels or a contrast curve down. And you then make those adjustments and oh, now it looks great on the monitor. 
But then you go to output that print, and that print comes out really dark. Why? Well, the file was actually OK. It was your monitor that was too bright, not the image file. And when you further brought the brightness down of that image file, which in reality was actually correct, the result is a really dark print. And I probably hear this one complaint more than anything. One of the reasons for this is because monitors are asked to do a lot of things. They're multimedia devices now. You're going to watch movies on it. You're going to be cruising the internet. Oh, you're going to do word processing. And oh, you're going to edit some photographs as well. Well, ph photographs need a monitor that is accurate, not something that's overly bright and overly blue because that makes your videos or your games look good. And leading into that, overly blue is something that can happen as well because it is fairly common so once again here we have an image scene yeah, it looks a little bit too blue so you're gonna to have to do some kind of adjustment so in this case well something that's overly blue we'll add the opposite color which will be yellow and oh now the image looks perfect but once again we go out to print and we get a print that looks overly yellow again why the same reason we got our dark print we made an adjustment to what the monitor was showing us rather than the data that was actually in the image file so we had an image that was actually okay but we added yellow to counter the blueness of the monitor and ended up getting a print that was way too yellow so as you can imagine the worst case is when you have both situations you get a dark yellow print we don't want dark prints we don't want yellow prints. We don't want any kind of off-color prints. Our goal is to get prints that are perfect and look exactly like we're expecting and have as close a match to that monitor as possible. All right, so now we know how important this first step is to get that monitor under control. Now, before we go into my Color Monkey software, just a couple questions came through. And again, if you joined us late, take advantage of the chat room. Uh, I'll get some of the questions here on the set and we'll address them live. Now, uh, one question was, somebody's using a color checker passport uh, and got really great results. Uh, they wonder if there's a way to combine all these profiles together to get a print that looks exactly as I see it on the screen. The, the, for those of you who are not familiar with it, what the color checker passport does is it creates a custom camera profile, which then gets applied in software. Uh, we're not going to cover that today. However, the process of seeing on the screen what your file looks like and getting it out of the printer will. In fact, someone just mentioned that they have calibrated their printer and monitor, and they're having trouble getting their prints to match their screen, and they're using an Epson R2880. Well, you're in luck, because I've got an Epson 2880 here, and we're going to go through the process. And also keep in mind that when we're done, we'll give you an email address. If something is still driving you nuts, uh, we'll find a way to, uh, to help you. Now, someone also asks that they've heard printers can only capture Adobe RGB and not the range of Proto. Profoto, is this incorrect? It's not an absolute statement. Most printers today, it uh, depends on how many inks are in the ink set, can go beyond Adobe RGB in certain colors. Other colors, they can't. Remember, even though they're, you're sending them an RGB file, these are using CMYK inks. So there are certain colors that are not natural to these printers. Red, for example, there's no red in these printers, so it has to use a combination of inks to do that. That has a tendency to limit the gamut. It's also going to depend on the paper. High gloss stocks have a bigger color gamut than less glossy stocks than the fine art papers. Uh, I see there's a, there's a lot more uh, questions coming up, and they're valid, so keep them coming. I'm going to get back to these, but I just want to continue on for a minute. Uh, let's actually take a look at my screen because I brought the Color Monkey software up. And you see from the start, you've got three main options here. Uh, match my printer to my display. That's sort of the, the holy grail of what we're after. You can also just profile your monitor. Let's, it's just something you should do from time to time. And if you don't have a paper to profile, you can just do that. Or maybe you just got yourself a new paper and you want to profile the printer. When they say profile a printer, you're actually creating a custom profile for the printer and paper combination. So you could call it a printer profile or a paper profile, both would be valid. So if I choose match my printer to my display, it will come up and asks you, what do you want to do? Now I've got two monitors here. I have my laptop and I have an ASO monitor connected to this. So it's asking which one I want to profile. So this answers the question, can you profile multiple monitors? The answer is yes. If I were to choose my external monitor, it, all it will do is it'll take this screen and immediately send it over to the other screen. So there's a lot more options here. So let's go ahead and do a monitor calibration. 
And we'll, so I, I did this as a movie to speed things up, so take a look. Let's start out by getting our monitor calibrated. Now when you start the Color Monkey Photo software, you see three choices here. Match my printer to my display, profile my display, and profile my printer. Well, let's go through the whole process, and we'll start by clicking here on the Holy Grail, match my printer to my display. Now, the first thing it asks you is what kind of monitor you have. Now, this says LCD. It really just means desktop. I'm currently on a laptop, so I'm going to choose that. And then underneath you have a choice of easy or advanced on the display profiling mode you'd like to use. I'm going to choose advanced because there are two questions I want to answer. First of all, I want to set the luminance of my laptop to a target value. I personally like to set my laptop to 100. I find it to be a good middle of the road point that gives me good results. If you'd prefer to have the device set the brightness of your screen based on the ambient light, by all means choose that selection. Also on target white point, D65 in almost every case is where you want to be. There are some people out there that have uh, said you should be at D50, and I'm going to say in the vast majority of cases that's really wrong. So just stay with D65. So I click on Next, and it says, OK, I see the color monkey, but it needs to be calibrated. So you need to rotate the face dial so that it matches the display on the screen, and click on Calibrate. And what it's doing here, in essence, is a little tile inside, a white tile. The Color Monkey Photo is doing its own internal white balance. Since it has its own internal light source, it can do that, and it will be all calibrated and ready to go. When it's done, you flip it back to the bottom position, and then click on Next. Now you load the Color Monkey into its little support pouch. Now when you do this, make sure after it's loaded in that you actually open up the little window on the bottom. There's a little door that slides there. Uh, we've seen a lot of tech support calls coming in saying my Color Monkey isn't working. And it's because the door is closed and the sensor just can't see your screen. So you hang the Color Monkey on the screen and click Next. Now the first thing it's going to do is measure contrast and brightness. And it's going to do this with white and then red, green, and blue. And when it's done, it's going to come back with a little indicator to let you know how bright or dark is your monitor and does it need to be adjusted to match the setting that you've chosen. In fact, you can see that over here on the left-hand side, and it's telling me, well, my measured white is way too high. I was going for 100, and I've got 221. So I need to hit the Down Brightness button on my screen a couple of times. And you see it's starting to drop down maybe one or two more. What we really want to do is to try to get it into this green area. You don't have to be exact about it, but we kind of want to get it right in here somewhere. Now, you're going to be within a couple of points either way. That's OK. Either a little bit over or a little bit under. Just kind of try to get it into here. You see, I'm jumping up and down 20 points. So let's see. I'm going to error a little bit on the low side. It drops back down. I'm getting 91 out of 100. That's pretty good. I'm going to click Next. Now that first part was the actual calibration. Now we're doing the profiling. And what the software is doing is it's sending known color values up to the screen. The Color Monkey Photo then reads them in, measures them, and compares them to what it's expecting. So for example, when the software says, give me 100% green, it's going to measure that. In many cases, it's going to be slightly off. So say instead of getting 100% green, it sees, oh, there's three points of blue in there. Well, that gets all calculated into the profile. And a profile is, in essence, a set of corrections, so that when you ask for a certain color, those corrections are made so that you get it. So in that case, once the profile is created and it saw that, oh, I need to take out three points of blue to get my 100% green, that's embedded in the profile. Next time your software asks the computer, please give me 100% green up on this part of the screen, that request goes through the profile, and the profile says, remember, if you really want 100% green on the screen, make sure you take out three points of blue. And that's what happens. The other thing I love about the Color Monkey Photo is, it's done. That's how fast it is to do a monitor profile. Now, I do like to include a name or a date in my name. I see it's November 18th, so I'm just going to put 118 here. Click on Save, and it will automatically be applied. Now, you also have the option to be reminded every one, two, or three, or four weeks. How often you do this depends on the age of your monitor. 
certainly once a month. I'd also recommend doing this right before you're going to do a big edit for a big print job. I'm going to turn off the reminder because I use a lot of different devices uh, to calibrate my system as I'm showing people how to do this, so I'll just leave it off. Click on Next, you can then see a before and after. In this case, my monitor had already been profiled, so I don't see a big jump, but you probably will. In fact, if you've never done this before, chances are your screen's going to look a little dimmer and a little yellower. But what's changed is now what you're seeing on the screen is an accurate representation of the data that's actually in your file. When you're done, you can just click on Next, and it will be ready to take us on to the next step. Okay, we've got a lot of questions coming through. I'm going to get to some of them in just a second. First of all, I just want to show you a couple of details about something on the Color Monkey that'll make using it a little bit easier. So here you see the we've got the Color Monkey here, and one of the things you need to be careful of, and that's when you're doing the rotation where it asks you to spin it around like when you want to go into calibration position. The outside of this ring is got a texture to it, and when you're spinning, that's where you should put your fingers. If you push in the middle, this actually acts as a mouse click and may confuse the software and try to advance. So when you're rotating, just put your thumbs or whatever fingers work for you on the outside and do the spinning of the side there. That'll make it a lot easier. <clears throat> now for questions, a lot of you have some very specific questions about specific operating systems and printers, uh, which is beyond the scope of what I could get into today. But when we're done, I will give you an email address uh, where you can send those questions, where we'll get someone to help you. But there's a couple of things I do want to talk about. Uh, first of all, a handful of you are asking about the color checker, which is a, a different subject, but just to answer, uh, someone said they use Aperture, uh, not Lightroom or Photoshop. Can they use the color checker for custom camera profiles? And the answer, unfortunately, is no. Uh, the color checker works in a DNG mode, which is what Adobe uses behind the scenes. They've been trying to get everybody else to adopt it, but there's a lot of fighting going on for that. So if you use Aperture or Capture One or uh, Capture NX, those kind of softwares for processing your RAW files, then the answer is no, you can't use the custom camera profiles in those softwares. Um, someone, wanted, someone said that they, they're, they're thinking that you cannot profile Canon printers with the exception of the Pro One, and that is not true. Um, I myself at home, I use a Canon IPF 6350, which is a 24-inch printer. And I create profiles with the Color Monkey and the i1 Pro for that all the time. It works just fine. Uh, you just have to be careful in the color management. Yes, you don't actually turn color management off on those printers, but it has a different default that works just fine. So you might want to send us an email on that. Uh, someone asked about calibrating a laptop. It doesn't matter. The, there's some confusion about whether it has a graphics card. It does. It's built into the motherboard. So calibrating a laptop screen is just like calibrating an external screen. And someone asked, they only have a laptop, is that good enough? Understand laptop monitors do have weaknesses. Uh, they're not the greatest displays. They're pretty good, but they certainly don't match something like this. That said, any monitor that's calibrated is going to be much better than one that is not. I travel a lot with this computer. I'll do editing on an airplane or what have you. And yes, I make sure it is calibrated. When I'm doing very serious editing, then I will plug it into an external monitor. But you can do a lot of editing on a laptop and get yourself pretty close. And then I like to res reserve my really serious fine edits for when I'm hooked up to an external. Again, this is an ASO. Uh, there's a lot of good monitors out there. Just figure you're going to spend some money to get one. Uh, generally, you're going to spend $700 or up to get a really good graphics monitor if you're really serious about that. Uh, a couple of questions about some other devices. Uh, some of you have Color Monkey Photos. Uh, some of you have Color Monkey Smiles. Those are just colorimeters. They only do monitors. They do not do printers. So we're not talking about those today. I will be talking about those in the next presentation. Uh, someone mentioned that the Color Monkey Smile does not support setting a luminance target. Isn't that important for achieving results that match print to monitor? The answer to that question is yes, it does. Uh, the Color Monkey Smile is designed more for hobbyists, people who are designing stuff. Maybe that's only going to be on monitor. It's going to go up to the internet. It's going to be on somebody's website. Or you're a gamer or, or you're watching videos, that kind of thing. If you're serious about photography and you want to send out to a lab or you want to do your own printing, then you're going to need to step up to the Color Monkey Photo or the Color Monkey Display or the i1, uh, I1 Profiler. So I display pro. 
so yes, the Color Monkey Smile does not support luminance, uh, and it's not designed for that. Let's see. Uh, someone said that I, I said that inkjets don't have red ink. Uh, they have a Canon 8300, and it does have red ink. Yes, some of the real high-end printers do. My 6350 has red ink. But most desktop printers, uh, something like the, the 2880 we have here, does not have red. It's just CMYK and a handful of different values of that and some different blacks. Uh, someone asked, uh, if you have two identical monitors, do you run the process twice? The answer is yes, you do. Because even two matching monitors, unless they're very high-end, are still pretty far from identical. Uh, when you get into the real high-end graphics displays like the ASOs and the high-end NECs, you can get a pretty good match for those. The lower-end monitors, though, you could have two of the exact same display, and just because of manufacturing variations, they're going to still be different. So understand that there are some physical limitations, and with these things, hate to say it, but you get what you pay for. There's no way around it. So still more questions coming in. Keep them coming, uh, but let's continue on. So we've got our monitor calibrated. Now we're ready to do a custom print profile. So you might ask, well, why bother with this step? Why not just use the profiles that come from either the printer or the paper manufacturer? Those are certainly better than not using a profile at all. But when you create a custom printer profile, what your software is learning is the specific capabilities of your printer paper combination. It truly learns the gamut and the color range that this printer can print, specifically this printer, not even this model, this exact one in that environment. Now, creating a custom paper profile is actually very easy to do with the Color Monkey Photo System, so let's see that done. The next step is to create our custom printer profile. So we're going to create a new profile, and I'm going to choose my Epson 2880 that has black matte ink loaded into it. Now I'm profiling one of Ilford's fine art papers. This is a gallery prestige and it's called Ilford Fine Art Textured. And I'll put R2880 so that I know which printer it was printed on. In fact I'm also going to add a CM in the front and you'll see this later in software why I do this. Just kind of makes it easier to find because the profiles are listed alphabetically when you go to use them in software. So then I click on next and it tells me print out this chart. Now there's a couple of important things you need to know when you're doing this. When you click on print, make sure that the settings in the print driver match the settings for the paper. Let's just continue and we'll take a look and see what that means. Now, I already have a preset for mine, but let's go ahead and go through the process. If you go to print settings, first of all, I'm using a fine, even though I'm using a fine art paper, these are specific for the Epson. I'm using um, a simulator, I'm using Ilford's paper, so I'm going to choose matte paper, and I'm going to choose the ultra premium presentation matte. Color, obviously. Color settings. Now, if you've never done this before, the default is Epson standard sRGB. If you do this, bad things are going to happen. You've got to make sure that it is set for off. You don't want the software, the printer driver, to be doing any color adjustments. Now, this printer supports 16-bit printing, so I'm going to do that. And also, you have photo and super photo. Uh, for doing profiling purposes, photo is just fine. High speed is okay to leave on. Mirror image would be for reverse printing, not something applies here. Then I would click, click on print. Now what I would want to do is save these. Save a current settings as a preset, which I just did. I called it Ilford Textured Fine Art. This is going to allow you to get back to this next time, so you're not going to have to go through these settings again. So then I would click on print, and my print will come out. I'm going to hit cancel just to speed this process up, because I already have my target printed. Then I click on next, and it says, all right, get out that first test chart, and let's measure it. So let's take a look at that process. I've got my test chart here, and I'm going to simply click, start on white paper, drag up the first row, let go, and it just tells you to do the same for each subsequent row. And it really is this fast. Now, if you mess up, if someone calls you away in the middle of this and your arm goes off from one color row to the other, I'll do that intentionally here. You see it circles it in red. It's just telling you, do it again. So you wait for it to turn to yellow, go over that last row, and there it is. We've just measured in the first 50 patches. Click on Next, and what it's going to do now 
This is going to generate, in essence, an interim profile. It's going to take a look to see at what state the printer is in. It's going to measure those colors and apply them to a new chart. Now, this second chart has more subtle colors. It's more earth tones, skin tones, and it's going to use this combination of a two-step process with 50 patches each to create a great profile. So again, here's our new chart. It tells you to print. And it's, again, it says make sure you use the same driver settings. So if I hit on continue, notice I've got my preset saved here. And when I go ahead to print, it's going to use exactly the same settings. Now after the chart has been printed, click on next. And you'll be presented with a timer and it tells you allow the test charts to dry. Now this is really important, particularly on fine art papers, because as the ink sets, as it continues to dry, it will usually get a little bit darker also. And this is more prevalent on a fine art paper because the ink does sink in a little bit more. Now even though it might be dry to the touch, it's not dry all the way through. So give it these 10 minutes and let the paper come to a full dry before you read it in. So now that our print is just about done drying, We'll just wait for this last 10 seconds to remain, and then we'll go ahead and measure it in. And the combination of these two charts, read separately in this order, gives you a much better result than if you just printed out all 100 patches at once, because it took the information that it learned from the first set and applied it to the second. So we can go ahead and click on Next, and go ahead and read them in as we did before. Again, just click and drag and it will just return you to each line. Again, if you mess up or you kind of drag off from one row into another, it will just stop you and ask you to do it again. And that's it. That's how fast it is to read in those 100 patches. Now, it adds to the name after the fact. I'm going to go ahead and pull that off because I named it just the way I wanted it. Got a little extra space there. I'm going to click on Save. The software will then generate the profile and also give you the option of making it the default profile for certain applications, which is handy if you only really use one type of paper. I myself use a whole bunch of different papers, so I would skip this step. But if you do primarily print on one paper, this would become your default profile. And it brings us back to the main menu, and that's it. We've calibrated our monitor, we've created a custom printer profile, now we're ready to put it to work. All right, a lot of questions still coming through. I just want to show you uh, one more detail about the Color Monkey because this confuses people as well. And that is the whole pouch system to be able to load this and hang it on your monitor. Now, the, the Color Monkey just slides into the pouch and then you zip it closed. And one thing that I've seen many calls come in on is they put it in the pouch and their Color Monkey won't calibrate their monitor. Well, usually it's because on the bottom there's a little door and you've got to slide it open so that the color monkey can actually see what's going on on the screen. And then you've got this strap here, which has a little Velcro, and this strap is weighted so that if you have a larger monitor, you can hang it over the monitor and it will sit in place. Uh, so just be, just be careful when you do it. Make sure the door is open. Okay, a lot of questions. Uh, first of all, someone said, I mentioned about sending RGB files to the printer. Why not sRGB? Actually, I'm, what I'm sending are Profoto RGB files to my printer. I'm leaving all my files in their raw state in their biggest color space because why limit the amount of color that's going out to a printer? Well, again, when I send out to a lab, that's going to be different. We'll talk about that in the next session. But for sending out to a printer that's connected to your computer, if you're in Photoshop, leave it in Profoto RGB. If you're in Lightroom, the default is Profoto RGB, so leave it there. Um, Someone asked about uh, why monitors are drifting. Uh, is it just time or is the monitor degrading? Mostly it's just variations in the electronics. As the thing warms up and over time, it's going to start to drift. The electronics are going to fluctuate a little bit. Yes, monitors degrade over time as well. Uh, my recommendation for that is when you're not using it, turn it off. And I don't even mean let it go to screensaver. Power off the monitor because even in screensaver, it's still receiving power and current going through electronics causes it to age. And someone does bring up a good point, does a monitor need to warm up before you calibrate it? Yes, that's a good idea. Particularly with uh, older monitors, uh, not the new retina displays, let them warm up. Let them sit on for a half an hour. Everything's gotten warmed up. They're up to their full brightness and they're stable. That'll give you your best profile. Uh, now, since there are a lot of questions coming up, 
about specific printers, specific monitors, specific questions about operating system combinations. I'm going to give you this one bit of information right now. So let's bring that slide up. If you have a question you want to send that is very specific, some kind of specific combination about printer or monitor or operating system, send the email here, answers at xrightphoto.com, and someone will get you back an answer as soon as possible. Okay, so someone asked, is if what I'm talking about just for raw files? No. Uh, raw files are going to give you the most flexibility, but really it's any file that you have up on your screen, that's what we're dealing with. Uh, someone asked, do you, should you do different profiles for the same paper with different resolutions? Uh, the answer to that is no, don't bother. Uh, it's really just big color patches. It doesn't care about the resolution. Uh, it's not going to put down a different color of ink. Uh, someone also asked about paper size. Here are the charts. Uh, here's the first chart. Here's the second one. And you can see they're just on 8.5 by 11 paper. That's the optimal size. That's what it is designed for. Because notice the color monkey doesn't have to use any kind of armature or, or box to hold the chart in. It actually just is designed to fit on the width that's produced on this 8.5 by 11 so that it can actually read those patches easily. So keep the questions. Um, someone asked if I want a more pro accurate profile. Can I rescan with more color patches? Actually, technically, yes. There are ways to do that in the Color Monkey software that are beyond the scope we're going to go into today. Uh, but we'll direct you to some x ray webinars that already exist that go into what's called optimizing a profile. So let's continue on. We've got our monitor calibrated. We've got a custom paper profile. So now let's put it all to use in Photoshop. So, Jen, if you'd show my screen. Here I've got an image ready to go. I've done some edits on it, and I want to see what it's going to look like on print before I actually print it. This is the soft proofing process. So what I do is go to View, Proof Setup, Custom. This is also why I named my profiles with CM in front of it so that I can find it. Because if you look here, I have this great list of profiles that goes on and on. All the profiles I've created start with CM, and here's the one that was just created. Now, if I toggle back and forth between the rendering intents that we'll use, and the only two you're going to use are relative color metric or perceptual, Let's see if we see a change. Look back here in the image and see if you can see a change. And it's subtle. Actually, I have it going on to this other image. Hold on a second. Let me do it on this one. Here we go. Sorry, I had the wrong screen up there. So proof set up custom, relative color metric versus perceptual. There we go. Now we're seeing it better. So you can see relative color metric has got a little more pop, a little more contrast. The darks are a little bit darker versus perceptual, which lightens up the image a little bit. Now, since this is going out to a fine art paper, I want to keep that contrast. I want to keep that pop in it. Now, a couple of other things here. Preserve RGB numbers. Never check that. Bad things will happen. This should just be hidden from the driver or from the uh, soft proof. Also, these down here, these display options, I also recommend don't waste your time with those uh, because they're way too strong. They're supposed to simulate the effect of the paper color and the black ink, but they so wash out the image, as you can see there, it just isn't even worth it. Uh, it doesn't really reflect reality. Uh, you're going to find, once you get used to it, you're going to be able to see on the screen what your print is going to look like. Now, speaking about rendering intents, this is something that also has people a lot very confused. What's the difference between perceptual and relative? When should, I, when should I use one over the other? Well, it depends. But what I've done is I've prepared a little animation that will go into a little more detail about what these two, relative, we, these two rendering intents do. So let's watch that first. Another topic that seems to uh, confuse a lot of folks is the whole concept of rendering intents. So let's take a look at that in a little more detail. Now what rendering intents are simply is they deal with colors that are currently out of gamut, meaning they're beyond the ability of the printer paper combination that you are using to actually print that exact color. It's beyond the color scope of the printer and paper that you are using. So something has to be done with those colors that are beyond that uh, printable area, and that's what rendering intents do. Now there are two choices for photographers, relative color metric and perceptual. Now, relative color metric 
takes those colors that are at a gamut, as you can see here, that are blinking, and is going to move them back into the printable space, which here is illustrated by that circle with all the colors inside. Now, in relative color metric, the colors that are already in the circle, already printable, stay exactly where they are. So in essence, here's what happens. We've got these few outlying colors, and what a relative color metric rendering intent does is it takes those colors and it moves them into a printable space without moving any of the other colors that are already there. Now there's advantages and disadvantages to this. The advantage is there's no real tonal shift in the image when you move these few colors in. They get put into an appropriate place that makes sense. If you don't have a lot of color out of gamut, it's a really good choice because it's going to cause very little color shifting in the image. Now the downside can be because these colors are getting moved into gamut and the colors that were already there stay where they are, the relationship between those colors can change. And the net result of this is you can end up having some breaks or banding in fine gradations. And I particularly see this in skies. If you have some blues that are out of gamut and they get moved, you no longer have that smooth transition and you end up being able to see a visible line there. Now the other common rendering intent is called perceptual rendering. And perceptual rendering is going to do the same thing. It's going to take those same colors that are out of gamut and it's going to move them back in. The difference is the colors that are within gamut that can be printed are going to move so that the relationship between the previously out of gamut colors and the colors that were in gamut remains the same. So again, using an animation, we have our colors that are out of gamut. And as they move in, the other colors move out of the way so that re that relationship is maintained. Now once again there are pros and cons to this. The good part is that it does produce a very natural color rendition. A lot of times this will work very well for portraits. Also if you have a lot of color out of gamut it will make things look kind of right to your eye. The downside however is you can have just a few pixels out of gamut and once that rendering intent takes place it can cause a complete tonal shift in parts of the image. And this is where soft proofing comes in where you'll get to see that. Soft proofing is wonderful technique and we'll talk about that. You get to see the effect that each of the rendering intents will have on that image through that particular paper's profile. You can then make adjustments to that image based on the rendering intent and the profile so that the print you get is going to closely match what you see on your screen. The only warning is before you do any of this you do need to make sure that you've got a calibrated monitor so that you can really see the true effect of that soft proofing. All right, a couple more good questions. Uh, somebody asked, can an existing ICC profile be edited? There are softwares that do this, but not the Color Monkey Photo. This, this, this software is designed to be powerful yet simple to use. You can enhance a profile by going into the optimization process, subject for another day. But as far as editing the profile, uh, not in this software. That's something reserved for the high-end systems. And someone asked, how does a Color Monkey profile compare quality-wise to a commercial profile service? It's actually pretty darn good. If you go to a higher end system, can you get a better profile? Yes, you will, get, you will squeeze a little bit more color gamut, a little more accuracy out of your printer. That's really kind of reserved for big prints though. If you're printing even up to 13 by 19s like on this 2880, I don't know if you're gonna be able to see a difference. That's something I do when I go out to my 6350. Now, even though this is 100 patches, the process that you saw where you first scan in the first set and then do the second one, uh, creates a better profile than if you had scanned all 100 at one time. So what it learns from here and applies to the second patch set does create a better profile. So it actually is pretty darn good. I've tested it against some commercial profiles. In fact, I've tested it against the factory profiles and they're uniformly better than all the factory ones. Uh, someone asked, said they're using roll paper. Do I have to go out and buy 8 and a half 11 to make my profile for the paper? No, you can print it on the roll. You're just going to have to cut it down when you're done. Um, someone asked, when you make the color patches, can you reuse those every time you want to recalibrate, or do you need to print new ones every time? That's an interesting point. Once you create a profile for a paper, you don't have to recreate it. Only if the paper changes or it's technically a new paper or something's changed in the coding. That's usually signified by the manufacturers change the name slightly of the paper. When you create a profile for your paper, you're done with that particular paper. No need to recreate one. One exception to that would be if your printer's starting to die. 
and you're starting to see a color shift in the printer. Then there's a problem in the printer. You could recalibrate, but if you're going to need to do that, then you would need to print out a new set of charts. Someone asked, is soft proofing possible? In Lightroom, the answer is yes. And in our follow-up, I will direct you to some articles that I wrote that go over the soft proofing procedure in Lightroom. Um, someone asked, is there a difference between Color Monkey Photo or Color Monkey Design, which I haven't touched on today, in the procedures that I covered? They're the same device. What the design does, it was designed for more of an artist's workflow. So it kind of comes around from the other side. It goes into color palettes instead first. It can do the same things. It just does it from a different direction. If you're a photographer, then I'd really recommend you stick with the Color Monkey photo. All right, I think that's it for now. So let's continue on. Let's go back into my software because I want to show you something else important on the screen here. Now, we saw a difference when we chose relative color metric versus perceptual. When you see a color difference, that means there are colors out of gamut. Uh, if you don't see any difference at all, then you could choose either one. It's not going to matter. But how do we know how much color is out of gamut when we go bouncing back and forth from relative to perceptual? Well, there is a thing called gamut warning. So if we go up to view, in fact, let me just close this. We'll leave the preview on, which means we're still looking at this print through the printer profile. And we'll go to view gamut warning. Now, you can't really see the default very well. You can see it kind of looks like it got some snow on it. You can see this gray, let me zoom in over here. You can see it's gotten this gray overlay as so I turn this on and off. So what it's saying is that some of that really bright limish green on the, on the lichens and moss are just too intense for this paper. They're gonna move. Now there's nothing you can do to make those colors print if they're out of gamut. It's just giving you a warning, these are the colors that are going to move. Now in general, and this is a generalization, if you've got a lot of color out of gamut, then you probably want to go to perceptual rendering. If it's a little bit, then relative color metric, but that is still a subjective call. One thing I do like to do, however, is change the color for the gamut warning because it can be hard to see under certain circumstances. So to do that, in Photoshop, go to Preferences, and you'll see something called Transparency and Gamut. And there's the default color. It's kind of this mid-gray. Now, I like to have it something real extreme, so I personally usually choose this really super ultra bright green. Hit OK. And now you can see it much better on my screen. Now you see the bright green showing up, showing where you where the gamut warning is. Now again, there's nothing I can do to make those colors print. They're going to be out of gamut. But we, again, we are looking at a soft proof. What it's telling you is that those colors are going to print like you see them even though the actual file might have a more intense green in it. It's just saying they're going to move. Now, one other thing. I'm looking at this print, and I'm going to go out to a fine art paper. I want to add a little bit of pop in here, and I can create an adjustment just for this particular image. So I'm going to go and create a brightness contrast adjustment, and I'm going to add some brightness and add some contrast. That gave a little bit more pop to the image. However, I did start to blow out some of the whites when I did that. So I'm going to just minimize that. I've got the mask here. I'm going to get myself a brush. I'm going to paint that. 70% oh, is good. I've got black in the foreground. And just on the mask, I'm just going to paint roughly over top of these water so that we get some of the detail back. So what that allowed me to do is to add a little bit more pop into the image. Again, it's going out to a fine art matte paper. Uh, but I maintained my white. So you can see there's the before and after. It's a big difference. It's got more life to it. So now the image is ready to print. Now I need to carry over my choices into the print dialog box. So when I go out to print, there's a couple of things I need to check. All right, I've got my printer set up. I've got Photoshop manages colors. If you haven't done this before, the default is printer manages colors. Don't do that. It'll just override everything we've just done. Printer profile is not sRGB. We have to go in and tell it our Color Monkey profile we just created. So I'll scroll down to our Ilford Fine Art Textured for the 2880. And I do send 16-bit data. And we did decide that we liked relative color metric better. And yes, do leave black point compensation on. Now, once again, down here, we've got this match print colors and show paper weight, et cetera, that exists here. 
Again, this is the same thing as those buttons we saw in the soft proofing process. I recommend, again, you ignore this. It's not going to look like this. It's going to be much closer to what you saw on the screen without it. Now everything's ready to go. This is what my image is going to look like. I click on print. A wonderful thing happens. I get a print that looks like the image I see on the screen. I've got my print here, and it very closely matches. Now, I say very closely because understand a print is being illuminated by the light shining on it, where my monitor is a calibrated system with a daylight color coming through it. Now, actually, when I hold this up right here and I look at the image on the screen, I can see that to my eye, this print looks a little bit yellower than what I see on my screen. Why is that? Well, if you looked around the studio, I've got these big tungsten lights over top of me and in front of me, which are yellow. This is calibrated to 6500K. These lights are probably about 3000. They're very yellow lights. So it's making my print look yellow. That's kind of an advanced situation. If you're going to actually hang your print under a very tungsten light, then you need to have the ability to change the profile. And that's what we're going to do two sessions forward where we get into real advanced profiling and adjusting a profile to a light source. Again, that's a subject for two sessions out. So let's review our steps. First of all, I hope you've been clear on how important it is to get your monitor profiled. If you do nothing else, make sure your monitor is profiled because it's really where you're making all your decisions based on what you see. When you start moving sliders around or doing layers adjustments, you're adjusting what you see on the screen. And if that's wrong to begin with, your print's going to be wrong. It's just going to get worse, and you're going to be guessing. Next, having a custom printer paper profile is going to give you the best results possible. It's going to get the most that the printer is capable of doing. It's going to expand the gamut, and it's going to make it more accurate. And lastly, learning the soft proofing process, be it in Photoshop or in Lightroom, or there are other softwares that do it. Aperture does it, for example, will allow you to make adjustments to the image like we just did before you send it out to print. That's going to save you a lot of wasted paper and ink, and that's saving time and money. Now, if I'm making it sound too easy, it really does work. Follow the steps we've gone through today, and you're going to learn how to get consistent and accurate prints. Now, as I mentioned before, there's a lot more to this subject. In our next session, we will dig deeper into color spaces and the steps you need to take to get great prints back from your lab. And then after that, we'll explore the world of fine art printing. We'll see how adjusting a paper profile to a specific light source can make that print look beautiful under practically any lighting. So I can actually adjust the profile so that these yellow lights, under those lights, my print looks like I'm looking at it under daylight. Advanced stuff, but if you're into fine art printing, that's what we'll do. So that's going to be it for today. I can see I've got the, my print coming out again with our edits that we just did. And uh, I'm not sure how well it would translate on the video, but I'm seeing a beautiful result coming out of my printer. And I'm getting a really nice match to the screen. So that's what we're after today. That's it for today. Remember, we're going to have a recording of this. You can review it. Actually, let's bring up uh, the answers uh, at X-Ray Photo again for those of you that had very specific questions about computer operating systems and printers and problems, etc. Please send the email here and it'll be directed to someone who can get you an answer. So thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you for all the great questions. Keep learning. Go through the steps, and this does work. I send out prints to my printer, out to my labs. I get books done. I have canvases done. I don't have to worry. I know that what I get back is going to closely match what I've got on my screen, and that's what we're after. So until next time, thank you all for watching. Again, thanks for the great questions, and be well. Bye-bye.